Hi there, my name is Caitlin. I am from grassfedgirl.com and I'm going to be reading The Fat of the Land. It is by Wilhelmer Stephenson. My section is the comments section. So it's kind of like the introduction, but it's before the introduction. So it's the comments section. And if you're not familiar with me, I'm a holistic nutrition consultant and I run the popular blog Grassfed Girl and the Instagram Grassfed Girl. And I have a YouTube channel, so uh, subscribe over there and you will see all of my information. And then I also have been on the carnivore diet for 18 months, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm just excited to read this book. It's gonna be awesome. So stay tuned for the comment section from The Fat of the Land. One thing I wanna point out, this book uses language that is um, a little out of date and it's from the 40s, so, um, I was trying to read word for word what the book says, but it is does use some language that I would not use myself. So I'm sorry about that in advance. And I hope that you can see past the outdated language for the, uh, the great content that is in the book. Okay, thanks for watching. Comment by Frederick J. Stair, MD, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, Boston. One day last January, the telephone rang. When I answered it, Paul White said, Stephenson is in town. Can you arrange for someone to stop by his hotel room and draw a blood specimen? You know he has been eating a largely meat diet for most of his life, and it would be interesting to know what his cholesterol and lipoproteins run. I've already asked permission for a blood specimen, and he has no objection. Not only had he no objection, but he came over to the laboratory the next day to volunteer a second specimen that we might have duplicate samples. And that was my introduction to Wilhelmer Stephenson. Since I have spent, since I have seen him and his charming wife, Evelyn, a number of times and corresponded has been frequent, I am always amazed at his intellectual vigor and his breadth of knowledge. Purely by coincidence, the School of Public Health was holding a seminar on the afternoon Stephenson came over to volunteer the second blood specimen. Two of its staff were sporting on field expositions of outbreaks of dysentery in the Arctic, reports which, of course, were delighted to invite Stephenson to hear. In that discussion that followed, his keen, sharp mind, wit, and above all, his anthropologic approach to the study of biologic problems were most evident. Those fortunate enough to read to have read his first edition, Not Bread Alone, Not by Bread Alone, are aware of its contributions to nutrition. It emphasizes the great capacity of the human organism to adapt to wide changes in the food intake and to maintain good health. Above all, it deals with the anthropologic approach a biological problem rather than an epidemiologic problem. Clinic, an epi, rather than with an epidemiological, clinical or laboratory avenues of which we hear more these days. The anthrop anthropologic approach to nutrition studies help confirm two points, that good health is realized, realizable by means of variety of dietary patterns, two, and this is the point is, is of particular significance for nutrition education. Different peoples evolve their own evaluations or standards as to the proper and improper dietary patterns. Stephenson spent many years living with the Eskimos in the days before the white man's habits had pervaded these people. He was not a trader, not a missionary, but an observer who took copious notes most of which are in his priceless collection of Arctic lore in the Stephenson Collection at the Dartmouth College Library. The study of cultural factors in nutrition has emerged only recently as a distinct focus of research, marked by the formation of the Committee on Food Habits and the National Research Council in 1941. Wellen, writing his, in Nutrition Reviews a year ago, mentions the concept of culture as developed in anthrop anthropology it refers to those aspects of human existence transmitted through language and group life. In any given society, culture is the design for living developed by the group 
a set of regulations governing the conduct of members. For individual, culture acts as a screen of values and perceptions through which the world, through which the person views food, his own body, his health, and the world. Stephenson began anthropologic studies of the Eskimos a half century ago, and thus was one of the first to use this discipline in human biology. It was his observation of the good health of the Eskimos, particularly their good teeth, that interested in him in relation to their lean and fat diet of meat that led him in later years with his friend Anderson to carry out under scientific scrutiny their year-long meat diet in this book. The dominant theme of not by bread alone, whether one is reading about steaks, pemmican, K rations, or biltong, the importance of meat, lean, and fat in the diet. When Stephenson's early interests result from his personal experiences in the Arctic, he has learned much from other extensive reading correspondence and discussions. Stephenson has probably consumed more meat than any other person today. When I gave him the dinner at the Harvard Club in Boston, it was roast beef, an extra serving of beef fat. At our home, it was steak with extra fat. Nothing else except martinis and cheese. Some of the fat is consumed first. This sounds a little like the DuPont Holiday Pennington diet, one read so much about a few years ago. In fact, that diet was the Stephenson regimen dressed up with a little bedside manner, which is the half hour morning walk and absolutely no alcohol. It is of interest to consider Stephenson's high intake of animal fat in connection with its current interest in atherosclerosis. Has it been good or bad for him? Would it be good or bad for you? Life expectancy at the time of Stephenson's birth was many years less than it is today, but he is seven years past what it is today. But, and in my opinion, an important but, Steph has never been obese. He has always been physically active and he doesn't overeat. Should you start eating more meat, particularly more animal fat? That depends on what you like to eat and how much you want to spend for food and how carefully you watch your weight. Of course, if, if we all begin eating more meat, their food wouldn't be enough, particularly of the choice cuts. But tenderizers do a good job of turning chuck or top roast or of the or top round into the first class dish. Once I asked Steph if the Eskimos used any tenderizing processes for tougher cuts of meat, and he reminded me the answer was in not by bread alone. Indexed under chewing. The answer is that they don't, but neither do they do much chewing. The uncivilized Eskimo has never had practice in herbivorous mastication and his mother has never told him to chew for the good of his health. So he gives the bite a piece, a piece, a bite or two, rolls it around in his mouth once or twice and swallows. But Steph is quite convinced that the tougher cuts of meat have the best flavor. And even at home, Evelyn uses tenderizers generously. One of the most interesting developments of modern nutrition has been the emergence of the number of studies emphasizing the great ability of experimental animals, including man, to adapt to wide var variations in diet. We all need protein, carbohydrate, fats, various vitamins, minerals, and water, but we can get these from a variety of foods. And Stephenson tells in his book why he thinks that we do not actually need more carbohydrate than is contained in whole meat and whole milk. Even the amount of these nutrients may be varied appreciably depending on the composition of the diet. It doesn't surprise me that Steph is in good health at 77, several years after his life expectancy. We have studied a number of vegetarians of comparable age and of equally good health. What is important is that our diets provide us with adequate amounts of amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids we need plus enough energy to balance our caloric needs so that we keep our weight in the desirable range. It is also important that we enjoy what we eat. I hope this new edition of Not By Bread Alone under its presently controversial new name, The Fat of the Land, will be as entertaining to you as it has been to me.
It is a pleasure to write a comment for this new edition of Wilhelmer Stephenson's book, originally entitled Not by Bread Alone. In his view of his interest in a high-fat diet, he has asked me to summarize briefly my own experiences and thoughts on the subject of life and heart disease, with particular reference to the causes of high blood pressure and of coronary arthros atherosclerosis, which is the basis when of high when of high degree for the clinical condition of angina pectoris and coronary thrombosis. For any good mini yin, we doctors have talked about these things, but only relatively recently have we done much more. Even now, we are barely scratching the surface. There appear to be two sets of causative factors, which may or may not be of equal importance. These are the basic or fundamental factors which concern the host and which one can do little about and the environmental factors which can be altered and the control of which may in some way neutralize or even supersede the harmful effect of the basic factors, thus combating, combating an attitude of hopeless fatalism. Prominent among, basic, among possible basic factors are race, a doubtful factor per se, heredity, which appears to have potent influence no matter what the race, age which is super which is an in superable factor as chronologically chronology is concerned but which may prove to be amenable at least to some degree as far as the psychological age is concerned and sex which is heavily weighted against the male in youth and middle age among the possible environmental factors are stress and strain which have yet been in, inadequately studied. Exercise, which has been hopeful, looked at by some of us as some use in prophylaxis, but value of which is as yet unproved. Toxic agents, in particular tobacco and alcohol, which are of doubtful importance, and diet, which now holds the limelight. Most workers in the field regard overweight from overeating as harmful factor, though not the chief cause behind hypertension, and a diet of overrich in total fat calories, such as the typical American diet in which 50% of the calories are in fat, as a potent factor in overwhelming epidemic of coronary heart disease, which has descended upon us in the present generation as a pernicious blight. On the other hand, there is a handful of observers like Wilhelm or Stephenson who have other ideas. In fact, almost the opposite, namely, that a diet very rich in fat, up to 80% of total calories, with the rest of the calories and protein, is the best for health. This raises the question, is it possible that extreme, that extremes of fat intake, i.e. very high, 80% or very low, 30%, are safer than intermediate mixtures of fairly high fat, 40 to 50%. Dr. Stephenson presented, presents his side of the case in the new chapter in this book. More controlled scientific data are needed by all concerned, especially by the high fat proponents. In any case, to paraphrase the title of the book, we may say that coronary heart disease is caused not by fat alone. Despite the probable importance of excessive fat in the diet, I quite agree with Stephenson that a study should be made of high-fat eaters 80% or more in contrast to the intermediate and low-fat eaters otherwise, who otherwise live the same way. If, however, the diet eventually proves to be an important key to our current problems in counteracting the effect of heredity, we may rest content. Okay, that was the comment by Paul Dudley White in 1956, July 1956. Now starting the comment by the author. Controversial was the label pinned on this book's first edition, and why shouldn't it be? The main allegations it set out to controvert were live issues in 1946. The belief that man cannot be healthy on meat alone to a high age has, had by then perhaps already disappeared from the medical schools but it was still widely held by the public, who, for the most part, still clung to the opinion that a high meat percentage in the diet was harmful and that meat or its effects had to be diluted with things like carbohydrates, 
The last belief really meant that our forebears must have lived on a food pernicious to them through the eons, the million or so years which preceded agriculture, for it is the consensus of the, <laughs> the ac applicable sciences and the history that before agriculture most men lived most of the time by hunting, fishing, and by gathering things like eggs, shellfish, grubs, berries in season, with a few roots and salad type vegetables, all of which would bulk large but would not yield many calories. As to how things were before and after the coming of agriculture in the usual views of historians and scientists, which are background to the book, and especially to this new edition, we quote from a recent and fascinating article by Johannes Iverson, anthropologic, anthropologist botanist, in the magazine Scientific American of March 1956, Forest Clearance in the Stone Age. The article begins, perhaps the greatest single step in the history of mankind was the transition from hunting to agriculture. In the Mesolithic age, men lived by spear, the bow, and the fishing net. The change came independently at different times in different parts of the world. Historians and archaeologists believe generally that the shift from a hunter diet, mainly of meat, to the gradual increase in carbohydrate blend of agriculturists came less than 15,000 years ago in China and the Near East 5,000 years ago in Greece and Italy, 2,000 years ago in England. Julius Caesar saw agriculture being introduced there by the Belgic settlers and only 1,500 years ago in Scotland. If meat needs carbohydrates and other vegetable additives to make it wholesome, then poor Eskimos were not eating healthfully till the last few decades. <laughs> they should have been in wretched state along with the north, along the north coast of Canada, particularly at Coronation Gulf. When I began to live among them in 1910 as the first white man most of them had ever seen, but to the contrary, they seemed to me to the, be the healthiest people I've ever lived with, to spread abroad the news of how healthy and happy they and I were on meat alone was a large pan of the motive for writing this book. We do not disagree that Iverson's perhaps the greatest single step forward in the history of mankind was the transition from hunting to agriculture, but we think of an, an, an interpretation is needed. Carbohydrate, gift of the farmer to us, makes civilization possible. For now we produce many times more food on a unit of land, but we have large families and leisure. We have built cities, but to make this a clear gain to man, it is necessary for him to turn a great pan of carbohydrates into meat and milk by feeding it to stock. Otherwise he suffers in individual health and in happiness for the unhealthy are unhappy. And carbohydrates, as this book explains, are not conducive to optimal health, at least not if taken as a high percentage of the meal. A distinguished orthodontist has said in the passage, we quote more at length hereafter, that the Eskimos are paying for civilization with their teeth. And as this book means to show, the decay of teeth is only one of several important losses in health we suffer as the price of the food abundance which enables us to dwell in large cities because we have a high standard of living. Because of limited space we can find ourselves from here on to comment on those two of our original 13 chapters that have proved most controversial. These chapters we attempt to bring up to date within the space allowed. They are the fifth and visit your here Visit your dentist twice a year, which, although no longer controversial, needs some amplifications, and the sixth. Living on the fat of the lamb, which needs both additional materials and considera consideration of strong attacks against some of its contentions. In chapter five, we consider only two points. What the first edition says about the lack of tooth decay among Eskimos, as long as they were on a hunter diet exclusively of meat, 
and what it says about the Icelanders having been without dental caries during the part of their history, about 600 years, when they were on the herdsman's diet, that is, on meat plus milk, we take Iceland first, because the new evidence there is more readily condensed. There were there were aborigines in Iceland, and the blood of the present population stems mainly from Ireland and Norway, with a total of probably less than 10% from Denmark, England, Scotland, and Sweden. From the beginning of firmly historical period around 18, 870 till 1100, Iceland had matinal comments, commerce, matinal commerce with Europe and imported some carbohydrates. Recent excavations of churchyards and other burial places reveal traces of little to decay. But after 1200, when the commerce is considered to have ceased, there was no tooth decay, nor does any appear until after 1800. The approximate renewal date by Iceland of modern commerce with Europe. This information came to me in a letter from Christian Eljar, director of the National Museum of Reykjavik. He says it is now, 1955, considered definitely established that there was no dental caries during those 600 years anywhere in Iceland. Today's dietary, today dietary, there is about that of England or New England, and the carry rate is similar with regulation dentistry toothbrushing and hard chewing of food for the good of teeth and like all of course with little result. During the decay free period 1200 to 1800 the foods of the Icelanders were in descending cal caloric importance milk and milk products, mutton, beef, fish. There were as we said no imported carbohydrates. There were only non-animal foods of any importance and then only in some places, soups made of Iceland moss. The moss, really a lichen, had to be secured by long journeys to the mountains, which made journeys, the literature shows, where summer picnics made more fun than for food. It is Pelion upon Osa and carrying coals to Newcastle to harp on it with an anthropo anthropologist that the tooth of the meat eater never decays, but the medical and related professions have seemed little impressed. Recently, however, signs of a new trend have come from dentists, more especially perhaps from orthodontists. For honors are descending on heretics who claim that for healthy teeth, diet is more important than the toothbrush. An example is the belated recognition of Dr. Loman M. Waugh of the School of Dental and Oral Medicine, Columbia University, whose, her whose heresies, like many of my own, were derived from seeing what the, es the European way of life is doing to the Eskimos. During his early days, Dr. Waugh made trips for five summers to Labrador and discovered about tooth decay what Dr. William A. Thomas of Chicago was then discovering there about rickets carries like rickets was worse where European foods were eaten the most. Both troubles were nearly or quite absent where European goods were unknown or negligible. Later though, a number of seasons, Dr. Waugh had similar opportunities for study in Alaska where he found like evidence and drew like conclusions. Through the expedient of living to a high age, Dr. Waugh has managed to be honored in his time and even by his own profession as a witness to the Boston Daily Globe of May 1st, 1956. Dr. Waugh received the Albert H. Ketchum Memorial Award, highest honor of the American Association of Orthodontists, now holding their 52nd annual session at the Statler. Among the points of Dr. Waugh's address, to the more than 1,200 members and guests were those according to the globe. Eskimos who had never been exposed to civilization had the best teeth in the world. No Eskimo had ever 
decayed teeth until he got the white man's diet. Eskimos have filthy mouths too. Not much evidence there that keeping their mouth clean has anything to do with lack of cavities. Uh, but, but while these honors were in preparation and the month before they were awarded, Columbia University more or less placed itself on record as still safely in camp for avoiding carries by hard-chewing school. For under date of April 1956, the Columbia Reporter had a paragraph on its Morningside Mentions page, clues to dental caries were hunted recently among the Amazon Indians by Dr. Hart H. Newman and Nicholas A. DeSalvo of the Faculty of Medicine. Their findings cor corroborate their theory that resistance to decay is related primarily to the pressure load placed on the teeth. That chewing with great pressure on hard foods results in work hardening, which causes teeth to become more resistant. In 1946 edition of our chapter, Living on the Fat of the Land, made a point of the high favor in which the Bible holds fat meats. We recited from the first book of Moses, the account of the first recorded offering to Jehovah, where Cain brought vegetables and Abel, the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof, and the fat thereof, and how the Lord had respect unto Abel for his offering, but unto Cain his offering had not respect. The Cain and Abel story reports the Lord of hosts direct in the fourth chapter of Genesis. In Genesis 45, 17 through 18, we learn by interference, by inference that both Jews and Egyptians thought well of a high fat diet. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, take your father and your households and come unto me. I will give you the good of the land of Egypt and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Our chapters tells also, how we consulted eminent Bible scholars, in particular Dr. Edgar J. Godspeed and his colleagues in Chicago, and learned their conviction that in this similar passage, the Old Testament Hebrews were thinking of fat mutton or mutton suet when they spoke of the fat of the land. Pursuing the topic, we quoted Isaiah 25 6, and in this mountain's shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, of fat things full of marrow, and not disagreeing with the scholars that usual such biblical quotations have in mind the fat meats and suets of mutton. We went on to show that beef fat was also held in high esteem. For in the New Testament, when a father welcomed home the prodigal son, he did not butcher an ordinary calf. He slew a fatted calf. In view of the developments retailed after, hereafter, we have since gone a bit further into bu biblical matters. We were able to do it more easily because fortunately a colleague here at Dartmouth College had assumed the task of writing articles on the food for the interpreter's Bible, dealing with foods both in their everyday and their ritual aspects. The first problem we consulted, Dr. James Ross was interpreting the currently much cited Leviticus 7:22 to 23 and the Lord sp spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel saying that ye shall eat no matter of fat ox or sheep of or of goat we question is the bible here saying that all men and for all circumstances that no one should ever eat these fats or is it meaning to prohibit these fats to certain people under certain circumstances. Dr. Ross said that he would like to study the case afresh in both view of our interest and his new work as a kind of food editor of a religious work for scholarly reference. But his preliminary view based on the usual approach of Bible scholars to such problem was, it is here being directed that when these fats have once been offered in sacrifice, or when is it intended that they be offered, then those concerned in the offering should not themselves partake. So we asked Leviticus, we asked whether Leviticus 7.23 was saying in effect, don't, 
So don't offer it and then take it back. When you have offered up in sacrifice delicious things like the fats of the ox, sheep, goat, don't try any such double crossing tricks as eating them yourself. Yes, Dr. Ross, that was approximately his offhand opinion pending further study of the case. Some weeks later, we had a second talk with Dr. Ross. Though other matters had preoccupied him, he had, to, he had a suggestion to look at the interpreter's Bible and take its verdict as his own pending his further study. And these are among the things we found, written by Nathaniel Micklem. Micklem. The context shows that Micklem is speaking of sacrificial meats. The fat is that which maintains life, and since life is God's gift and prerogative, man has no right over it. This commentary on Leviticus also says that the fat that was interlarded with the lean might be eaten, even of a sacrificial meat. The commentator's emphasis is here on much higher sacrificial rating of the clear suet as distinguished from the fats that are streaked with lean. This would be the importance of the words we now italicize from the fourth chapter of the first book of Moses. Abel brought the first brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, meaning that he brought not only fat meat but also separate fat or suet. Our chapter about living on the fat of the land makes a good deal out of the contradiction between the fashion of 1946 to warn against high fat diets as overheating in hot weather and the uniformly opposed nature of anthropologic, anthropological and historical evidence. For the hottest countries are, in their lore and literature, the greatest praisers of fat. The Homeric poems are relatively from relatively warm lands with warm summers and resemble our scripture in having not a kind word for lean meat. <laughs> but Homer, like the Bible, is larded with the praise of fat meats. An example is Iliad's description of the repast spread for the demigod Achilles, book uh, 9. Patro... Patroclus cast down a great fleshling block in the firelight and laid there, there, there on a sheep's back, and the fats, fat goats and a great hog's chine rich with fat. In contrast with Homer's account of from Greece, and the Bible's still hotter Palestine and Egypt are religious and profane classics of northern European peoples preserved to us most extensively by the Scandinavian Edas and Sagas. One reading of these from childhood in the original fails to supply us with quotations in praise of fat to match those we find so easily in subtropical books. As to the current relish of fat, the taste of the colder and the waner lands now vary now as they used to do. Within the relatively small geographic compass of the United States, and it, is, and it is apparent when New Englanders visit the Deep South and complain that the food there is greasy, we notice it still more when the North Americans visit Latin America and, for the, and the complaints are louder. When the Fat Meats chapter appeared in 1946, we received mail from tropics lanatively asking why northerners fail to grasp the principle that for the hotter weather the fattest foods are best. So except perhaps in the deep south, our newspaper readers and radio listeners were no doubt generally bewildered in the summer of 1955 by, by the news that a professor in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology had recommended high fat diets for hot weather. This was Dr. Robert S. Harris, Professor of Nutritional Biochemistry, Department of Food Technology. In a letter to us, he disclaims credit by saying he merely stated in his lecture, a fact now well established that foods higher in fat lower the specific dynamic action during digestion and metabolism.
technical science may not owe Dr. Harris a great deal in this particular regard, but the public owes him much, and so do scientists of other disciplines. For today, a specialist knows no jargon except his own. In the gamut from astronomy to zoology, there is many a professor vague on the meaning of specific dynamic action in relation to foods and hot weather. But everybody knows what you mean when you say the hot weather fat foods are good for you. In the hot weather, fat foods are good for you. According to Thorstein Veblen, a function of each special jargon among scientists is to keep other disciplines from butting into your field. If they don't quite get what it is you are writing and talking about, it is that much harder for them to criticize you and complete compete with you effectively. Meanwhile, for a greater reason, the layman also remains in the dark. Now the public at least is heavily in debt to Professor Harris and to newspapers and radio for getting specific dynamic action translated into vernacular. In disclaiming credit, Harris cited Harry Clapp's Sherman edition of the Chemistry of Food and Nutrition, Macmillan Company. Then he cites Holman Lundberg's Malkin Progress in the Chemistry of the Fats and Other Lipids, Academic Press, 1954. Less energy is wasted as the fat content of the diet is increased. It goes on, I quote, for Forbes suggests that it is not necessary to diminish protein contents of the diet during hot weather in order to ensure a low heat increment. Rather, one need only substitute fat for some of the carbohydrate. That is the significance of the area of practice when 110 and hotter in the shade, they eat fat mutton and use tidbit of hunk of specially fat tails of the sheep. They are then taking advantage of the principle that fats in foods lower specific dynamic action. Precept of Arab and principle of chemists did not mean much to most of us until someone like Dr. Harris translates for us into everyday speech and with all of the best into a slogan to give us fat foods for hot weather. Fat foods for the fat should be another one of the slogans and is on the way of becoming so through a series of tests in high fat diets performed at the instance of two of our largest corporations, the DuPont Company of Wilmington and the Lever Brothers Company of New York. DuPont tried their test on vice presidents and other costly executives desiring to prolong their lives at a health level of increased efficiency, which sounds practical. Lever Brothers may have been still more practical when they managed to enlist 122 students of Texas State College for Women instead of using corporate corporation dignitaries such as my classmate and friend since the gay 90s, John M. Hancock, chairman of their board, who was a bit overweight the last time we saw him and who may still have a number of fleshier associates, associates among his presidents, vice presidents, and managers. We consider first the less sensational but to date more famous DuPont executives test. Our outline is drawn from the three semi-accredited articles in the Holiday Magazine for many think of this as the holiday diet. Calling on the magazine's cover, Eat All You Want Reducing Diet. The presentation was by Elizabeth Woody based on information from those at DuPont who were at both who were both on and in charge of the routine. Besides the nearly all meat diet, the regimen was essentially a brisk half hour walk in the morning, then ordinary duties the rest of the day, and a normal evening such as it presumably is usual with corporation executives. The calories were apparently derived from something over 20% from lean meat, something over 50% from fat, and something less than 30% of other things permitted, such as a small helping of baked potato, fresh fruit, or salad type vegetables. According to Miss Woody, the reducing of the corpulent proved painless and even pleasant. Some said they were going to stick to the diet, 
permanently. One of the many things that seem beyond a doubt is this proved the most successful magazine the article Holiday had ever published to date. According to one story, they reprinted it and sold at 10 cents a copy more of Miss Woody's separates than, than there had been original copies of the June issue. Even after a year of the magazines ran, ran a history that far of the eat all you want reducing diet Miss, by Miss Woody, the cover of the magazine read all about the holiday diet and it was a tale of triumph because the lean meat had it perhaps because lean meat had at the time a better press than fat meat and this was played up as a high protein diet and indeed appeared it appeared a high protein diet as it as we are aware of having spent a year in 1928 to 1929 on its near equivalent the Russell Sage diet which served per day 28 to 30 ounces of lean which through though they yielded only per cent of our energy still appeared to have a huge pile alongside the eight or nine ounces of the fat of the edges of our sirloins which gave us 80 percent of the calories actually the main energy source of the dupont holiday diet are similar to what ours were at bellevue between the lean and fat with the Mentioned token holiday servings of other things like salads, fruits, baked potatoes. The greens and the other fruits bulk even more than the lean, so that the fat meat in the holiday diet would not strike the naked eye and fond as you are sure to become of the fat edges of the sirloin of your holiday diet, you eat them first, begin your meal with them like a boy who begins by eating the butter off his bread and the scarce notice they are gone unless you hanker for more. Historically speaking, the low down on the holiday diet did not come until the magazine's issue for September 1951 in an article entitled Footnote on the Eat All You Want Diet, subtitled More About the Enticing Never Feel Hungry Way to Reduce. The article was Earl Parker Hansen's warmly introduced by Elizabeth Woody. Holidays consulting food editor from it appears from it appears the outline of the story which we tell with few variations and addictions from other sources additions from other sources analyzing the Hansen presentation we find the sequence of names might have been chronologically the Eskimo diet the friendly Arctic diet the Blake Donaldson diet the Alfred Pennington diet the DuPont diet, the holiday diet, expanding a bit while there in while there were in pre white times many Eskimos who use no vegetables, there were some, especially in Labrador and Alaska, who got many calories from vegetables as the holiday diet does. So even with a few things like lettuce and potato we may well name this regimen for Eskimos. The same diet is described in my 1921 book Friendly Arctic as used and enjoyed by whites who like the Eskimos found it non-fattening and thus a good reducing menu. Then Dr. Blake Donaldson, successful New York physician, read the book and concluded that with a few things to make the regimen more acceptable, such as salad, fruit, and a token potato, it would be a good reducing diet, so it proved. A young dis disciple of Donaldson was Alec Alfred Pennington, and by the time the need arose for reducing DuPont's corpulent excessives painfully, he was already high in corporations, medical setup, and got a chance to try out what was for him, the Blake Donaldson's diet, as Indeed it is, for the DuPont and holiday menus are substantially those developed in his obesity practice by Donaldson. All of this to a friendly story. Blake Donaldson introduced himself somewhere back in the early 20s as we were going up in a New York skyscraper elevator and, the, and credited us as he has done since for giving us, giving his thinking a spur through the Friendly Arctic book. 
and thus to an extent influencing his obesity tactics and strategies. Nor has Pennington been less generous, nor has anyone else been insuff insufficiently generous to our view. The DuPont Company's triumph in health preserving and painless weight reducing of its executives with a high fat diet was reached through animal fats chiefly with beef sirloins and roast. The company is not in the business of selling food and has no commercial bias in the choice of fats. But Lever Brothers, as merchants in vegetable oils, and naturally it was presumed and naturally it was presumably vegetable derived margarine which supplied the high fat element of the test they organized. So far as we know, the chief of those tests was on coeds and the aim was broader. DuPont wanted improved health with slimmer figures and got both. Lever Brothers wanted improved health, slimmer figures, and better conceptions, and they got all three. So theirs was a greater triumph than DuPont's, but it came later, to which the extent is only the Lever firms behind. Physically, the success at Wilmington, Delaware came in 1949-1950, and the, the large-scale pub publicity began with the holiday of June 1950. Physically, the success at Denton, Texas, came in the period before December 1955, and the sensational publicity at the, was at the height in December 1955 and January 1956. The low, medium, and moderately high-fat nutrition test of the Texas State College for Women were conducted by the Dr. Pauline Beery Mack, who was, before she became dean at Denton, won her nutritionist spurs in the East, presumably uh, notably at Pennsylvania State University. Instead of writing a whole chapter as we should like to do, we oversimplify in stating the Texas case. The girls in the Texas State College for Women at Denton, mostly teenagers, were given the chance to volunteer to live for an extended period of time on one of the three vi varieties of what is essentially the basic seven diet. The variation as near as could be managed being only in percentage of calories derived from fat. Because many of the girl candidates thought the high fat diet would be fattening, those inclined to stoutness tried to get into the low fat group. A number were troubled with acne or other complexion dif difficulties as many of these had been told to avoid fat. Still it appears that they were obesity prone and complexion troubled volunteers for all groups. So far as we know, the dentist, the Denton test publicly had not been specialized in by any magazine such as Holiday. Their publicity seemed to have been thus far chiefly straight news stories on the radio and in the press, on the women's pages, in beauty, and in food columns. Dean Max summarized the results of the study for us in the letter of July 26, 1956. In the tests made at the Texas State College for Women, three controlled diets involving one was moderately high fat content, one was an intermediate fat content, and one a very low fat content, showed the weight status was more easily retained, skin condition was superior, and fatigue resistance was better on the highest of the three fat levels, which involved 30 to 35 percent of the total intake as fat. When margarine was one of the components of the total fat in the controlled diet, hemoglobin concentration, dark adaptation, and bone density undoubtedly related to the vitamin A content were superior. Perhaps we should not write up the teenager triumph that didn't along the lines we are using. Dean Max and his voluminous and striking scientific data, but nothing new was demonstrated in her test except that one thing, except the one thing that counts. Denton gained for moderately high fat diets, the publicity, which the truth seems to require nowadays, perhaps more than any previous age, Dean Mack got the attention of the teenage college girls who suffered acne and the men's colleges were not long behind. For boys have acne too. Boys don't worry so much about their figures in college, but they're going to when they get to be Lever or DuPont executives and they too will bless Dr. Pennington and Dr. Mack. While teenagers were profiting moderately high fat, 
the blessings of the same tactics were spreading farther south and to lower ages in the University of Texas. For instance, to their medical branch at Galveston, where Dr. Arlid E. Hansen, chairman of the Department of Pediatrics, was improving the standard formulas by increasing fat content, getting thereby less crying, sounder sleep, better results generally, as he wrote to us on May 20th and June 2nd, 1956. Unless we forget, Texas was not the only progressive state in moderately high-fat diets. True, their releases were, to our knowledge, the first to point out the high fat in their successful diets. The Delaware announcements hid the fat under the name of meat, which to the general public means lean, only when you scrutinize the holiday regimen. Indeed, only when you get your information from Pennington Direct or from his technical publications do you see the importance of fat in the DuPont regimen, where its quiet role has like significance to its publicized one in the lever diet. As for the difference that the lever, levers use vegetable fat and that the DuPont animal, no one as of yet has an exper experimental determination of what, if anything, that that difference means to the health of the diners, whether those are better off who specialize in fat on their sirloins or those who spread margarine thick on their bread or use it as shortening. True, it is claimed that margarine is cheaper, not in our town. In, Ham in, ha in Hanover, New Hampshire, we pay for our margarine, but we get our suet without charge as kind of a premium if we buy a trim steak. It seemed then that a path of the garlands for the high fat regimen, my own skies were particularly rosy for letters were coming in from the tropics and the deep south where they liked my books saying that fats are good in warm climates. Particularly I'd set up when reports told my that my works issued as popular were breaking into the technical circles and were mentioned seldom with a sneer at medical conventions. Particularly I was gratified that the Bellevue Hospital test of 1928 where Anderson and I lived for a year deriving four out of Every five units of energy from animal fat, mostly beef and mutton, was being spoken of after three decades as a scientific milestone. High fat was riding high, and so was I with it, proudly. But the pride goeth before the fall, and what a fall there was, my countrymen. The first cloud in the sky was no bigger than a man's hand, and in fact no larger than a brief and friendly personal note from Dr. Ansel Keyes, head of laboratory of physiological hygiene of the University of Minnesota, in which note he said he was sending me a copy of his latest paper on dietetic fats. This did not sound ominous. For one, I remember vividly the support he had given me in the course of the Second Pemmican War, which chapter 13 of this book describes as a dispute between some army physiologists who said the pemmican I favored as one of one sort of emergency ration had too much fat in it. Keyes had then written me that if pemmican contained no other ingredient than beef fat and lean, he thought as high as 86% of the calories from fat would probably be all right. He and I seemed pulling together on animal fats then, about 1944. When I read his paper in 1954, I did not feel so sure anymore that in him we still had a potential booster for regimens like, Doc, like the DuPont and Lever Brothers diets. Doubtless the storm had been long brewing, but I was preoccupied, and despite Key's paper, I awoke to the changed situation only with the near tragedy of our president's illness in Denver and the babble of discussion which followed, where now I heard from all sides that we were a nation in terrible straits, that a deadly sequence had been established. Heart disease is the chief cause of death, they said, and the United States has more heart trouble than any other country. A high-fat diet is provocative of heart cases, and we are the heaviest fat eaters in the world. Luckily for my peace of mind, I was already past 75, half of that span living on the fat of the land more literally than most. 
and still of sound heart according to a recent physical except that presumably I should have been dead of heart failure long ago I might have been frightened by the death of frightened to death by the clamor instead I felt annoyed thinking the rust sage battle of 1928 might have been fought over again the attack on meat in the diet had been backed 50 years ago and had even been launched by men as prominent in their day as the viewers with alarm were today in the 1920s and before they had attacked meat because of the lean element it contained animal protein now they were attacking meat because of its fat element probably the great authorities of today are as wrong I guess as the great as the great were then everybody now praises the animal protein which was so feared then very likely within 20 minutes everyone will be ditchy rambic once more about animal fats that seemed to be a good bet so counter suggestible as I am when the dirges began to penetrate I asked my wife if she thought it practical for me to abandon the basic seven diet on which nearly like nearly everyone I had been on for living for seven years and revert to the Russell Sage Bellevue Hospital diet of four energy units from beef or mutton fat for each unit of lean she said that this would simplify our housekeeping and that she thought save us money too for the anti-fat campaign had been so pervasive in Hanover that considerate owners no longer fed scraps of fat to their dogs and cats instead they fought for them the rich lean and the butchers are hard put to give away the fat all we have to do for a 5,000 calorie diet was to buy 1,000 calories of lean and they would joyfully measure us 4,000 calories in fat from bewildered meat sellers and in other ways the news spread through Hanover that we were all courting disaster at our house by gouging on fat meats at least I was and of course my wife was increasingly tempted to follow me I began to feel somewhat healthier than before which doubtless would have gone unnoticed at first except for my remembering how well Car Karsten Anderson and I used to feel in the Bellevue Hospital days and there were other blessings the first notable one of these came with my morning newspaper in a dispatch from Boston which quoted Dr. Paul Dudley White heart specialist to the president and as agreeing with both Ansel Keys and the Bible on the dangers of being with on the dangers of high fat diets his scriptural agreement being with Leviticus passage it seemed as if time might come when the medical men of our country would pass on to their fellow citizens the kind message of the Lord of host direct directed Moses to give the children of Israel ye shall not eat the fat of the ox or the sheep or the goat the Associated Press story gave such an opening to the flippant to be flippant that I could not resist writing to Dr. White and then known only to me as a distinguished Harvard medical professor and heart specialist because of the university association I accredited myself to him as an alumni of Harvard Divinity School and to warn him and the rest of the medics that if there were no that if they were to decide to endorse the Lord on this particular diet pronouncement they might find themselves in at least seemingly disagreement with the Bible on one or more of its other diet passages and that they might find a swarm of theologians buzzing around their medical heads for the Bible speaks well of fat meats and I went on to quote him some of the fat appreciative pas passages such as those of my living the fat on the land chapter in this book there came by return a charming note as implying as Dr. White later made still clearer that he was not endorsing the anti-fat people but merely confirming that for the time being they seem to be having the best of the argument he went on to say that we are only at the beginning of our knowledge of what causes various heart and circulatory troubles especially when he conscious 
especially was he conscious of our need for more knowledge of dietetic matters. And then Dr. White laid himself open. He spoke of wanting to know more of my views and experiences and said that he looked forward to one day reading books of mine. So, of course, I sent him one, this one. Perhaps two weeks passed and I felt more strongly what I had realized the moment I sent the book, that there was and should be limits of to forwardness and jocularity even among fellow alumni of the same university. But then came a four-page close handwritten letter from a resort in New Hampshire. Dr. and Mrs. White were there for the rest and were reading my book to each other, perhaps reading themselves to sleep. He was writing me on a few points which he had n noted so far and he wanted my comment. Then followed 18 questions, a few of them with subheads, and occasionally subheads A, B, C. I spent two full days pounding out on my typewriter the best answers I could think of to his questions. Six or seven pages, single spaced. A third letter came. Evidently, he, we had for discussion more points than a correspondence could handle, and we ought to get together. Would I let him know the next time I came to Boston? By return mail, I said the hotel we usually stay at in Boston is on the same street with his office, that my wife and I were spending three days there soon because of a day's conference at the Harvard Divinity School on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that perhaps he and I could get together either the day before the conference or the one after. He replied asking if he would... If he would dine at his home the evening before the scrolls lecture. His wife was interested in the scrolls. He said he was indeed taking a Bible course at Radcliffe with Mary Ellen Chase, and by implication we could talk before or after the dinner of the ancient scrolls and of fat meats. We did more than that as to the fat. For among the cocktail foods were strips of rare bacon enveloping bits, bits of pickled rind, and at the dinner, we had marrow bones. What with our Dead Sea Scrolls discussion, the evening reminded us of what the Bible promised unto the chosen. A feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, a f of fat things full of marrow. The wines in our feast being replaced by cocktails. These events, which led to an admiring friendship on my part for Dr. White, led also to his writing a comment for the second edition. It led further both to friendship and to what looks like the beginning of a collaboration with Dr. White's friend and collaborator, Dr. Frederick J. Stair, Chairman, Department of Nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, who has written a more general and longer comment. Okay, that's it. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the comments section of the Fat of the Land. Again, my name is Caitlin. If you like this, please subscribe to my channel. Usually my videos are about 10 minutes and they are about the carnivore diet. So uh, definitely watch those and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Uh, make sure and go on to the next chapter, which is the introduction. And that will be on another carnivore friendly page. All right. Thanks so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.